as befitting the house sigil of a great bear. The troops known colloquially as House Mormont Bruisers hit hard and go down fighting. Their light armor consists mostly of padded leather and light chain, giving them decent mobility. The last thing an opponent wants to face are these troops on a flank. When suffering losses, bruisers only become more dangerous, vowing blood for blood and often taking their enemies with them. Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name's Brian, and in this video we're going to talk about a not very recent release, but recent enough release for the for House Starks, the House Mormont Bruisers. Now, this is an infantry unit that comes with five unique sculpts. There's a banner bearer and then four other uh, little infantry dudes, grunts, or just models, whatever you want to call them. And there's no attachment that comes along with this uh, with this unit, but they come in at seven points with a movement of five. They have a melee attack called Mace and Spike that hits on threes or better and has a 7-6-5 decay stat. Their defensive capabilities are a 5 plus defense save and a 6 plus morale. For the melee ability Mace and Spike, they have a before rolling attack dice, choose one. And then for each of the unit's destroyed ranks, you choose an additional one, and you get critical blow, precision, or reroll any attack dice. They also have a counter strike as an ability, which states that each time this unit is attacked with a melee attack, for each miss, the attacker suffers one hit. So right off the bat, some of the big things that we can notice is that seven points is pretty pricey for a unit that's got a five, six save or for the 5-6 defensive stats, that's not extremely survivable, which I think kind of plays into their motivation a little bit because they want to have at least one or two destroyed ranks. It's one of the things with Starks. You kind of have this balancing act where you want your units damaged, but not to the point where they're easy to just kind of swipe out in one fell, in one fell swoop um, because the Mason Spike ability does allow them to get a little bit better as they start having more ranks down. But the, the big thing to pay attention to with these guys, in my opinion at least, is their very aggressive attack stat. They're hitting on threes. They have a 7-6-5 stat, so they're only going down one by going down by one dice each time. And I'm pretty okay with the way that their uh, offensive capabilities shake out. And your opponent will kind of be punished in multiple ways for attacking this unit. They'll when they attack the unit, if they wipe out a rank, they're likely to turn on another ability that they didn't have previously. They also have that counter-strike ability, so they can be punished for every time they end up missing an attack against this unit. So they have to be really careful about what they put into this one, uh, because they, they can damage in multiple ways outside of really their activation, I guess. I guess the, the they have to damage inside their activation with Mason Spike, but your opponent's influence on what they do to this unit matters in terms of the, the the swing back that they end up putting in on them. So before I go into the synergies with like commanders or attachments or anything, I do want to emphasize a bit of what uh, the Stark Tactic deck brings to this unit because I think some people are a little bit mopey on the Stark Tactics deck, at least, you know, the last time that I was really involved with the community at large, I think most people are not extremely happy with where the decks landed, but I do appreciate a lot of the things that the Stark deck brings to this, or to this unit specifically. The first one would be Winter's Might, because getting Sundering on a unit like this, it's not an ability that they get normally, but it gives them the the, the capability to really cut through things with that really large attack stat. Um, and if they, you know, the, the extra stuff on it isn't really the biggest deal in the world. If they only have one remaining rank, they can reroll any attack dice. They're going to have that anyways if they're only on one remaining rank, but rolling the highest attack die value is pretty nice. It's only an extra two dice, but th throwing seven is a lot better than throwing five. So Winner's Might is something you want to make sure that you can slap on this unit to get some extra damage out of them, as well as Northern Ferocity. Giving Vicious is pretty nice. I think people don't uh, really frame Starks as having a whole lot of panic shenanigans, so they don't really. I don't think they feel like they need to be bringing an extremely resilient morale list against the Starks. So having Vicious just kind of might give you a little bit of an edge where you might not have had one before. And um, the if they have that one rank remaining, you know, like if you're really getting down to the nitty gritty of the game, you can end up suffering inflicting two extra wounds on a failed panic test and also can make them panicked if you control the swords or the combat zone. So I think Northern Ferocity is something that could bring some neat synergy to the list. 
I also really like Assault Orders uh, when, when looking at this unit. Um, it allows you to manipulate the tactics board a little bit if you want to just try and keep pushing that aggression. Um, if you do happen to claim the swords and get a free charge out of it, then that's really cool. But taking something like denying your opponent a zone that they would really like to have and then just exchanging it for a free attack when they might have already taken that combat zone is a really... Uh, a really smooth move for a unit like this that wants to be hitting constantly it's good you want to make sure that the house mormont bruisers are always a danger to your opponent to make sure that they try to put something in there but again you want to try and balance it to where they're not committing so much to remove them because with a five six stat they are kind of uh papery they're they're i guess you could call them glass cannon ish but uh the seven point investment is a little harsh on them but i just wanted to go over a couple things that the stark tactics deck brought to them before we really dove into some of the other uh, aspects of this unit so i think where i want to start off with outside tactics deck synergies would be the no-brainers and that's going to be howlin reed the protector of the neck this is his ncu version this one's a little bit more narrow than the next one but you get to influence a enemy unit or you yeah you influence an enemy unit and then um the attacker suffers minus one to hit and treats all terrain as having the hindering and rough keywords. This is just a synergy with counter strike or counter attack. Um, if your opponent's minus one to hit, they're less likely to kind of go into them. They'll have to think twice about charging or uh, using some of those tactic zones when they don't have rerolls. Um, so he's a, a pretty easy one to take with them. Uh, Howlin Reed's just good in general. But then Serial Pharrell is another interesting pick for the unit. Giving them precision does sound like a redundant uh, ability, but the cool thing about precision is that you no longer have to worry about trying to get this unit down to their final rank in order to turn them on. You can kind of balance them at that two rank level where they're still throwing six dice, they're getting precision crit, crit blow, and they're re-rolling all of their hits. Additionally, they are the ones that get the minus one to hit when your enemy's attacking them. Now, if you were to get really, uh, really crazy and combine Serial Pharrell with Howlin' Reed, now you're minus two to hit, and I really don't think your opponent's going to appreciate coming into them, but they'll have to because having only two ranks on them, or, or only missing one rank, I should say, makes this unit extremely dangerous. You're, like I said, crit below, precision, re-rolling dice, you're minus two to hit. <clears throat> And that's something that your opponent's going to... They're not going to want this unit on the table, but they're going to be punished harshly for going into it. So if we're looking a little bit more bargainy on the attachments, uh, we can look towards the Mormont veteran. For one point, she just gives them the ability Harden that states each time this enemy is performing an attack on this unit, after rolling the defense dice, they block one hit and then one additional hit for each one of their destroyed ranks. So if your uh, gist is to get these guys down but not have them down so far to the point where they kind of are flapping in the breeze the mormont veteran can help you out and make sure that once they get lower in ranks that they're more survivable by just auto blocking hits it's a pretty nice uh a nice buff to the unit to try and make sure that they can sustain this world of being in the danger zone so i don't think that she's a bad pick for slapping onto the mormont bruisers i think the final attachment that i want to go over and there are multiple other ones that I could insert here, but I do think Brawn the Cell Sword is really decent on this unit for one point. It brings them up to eight eight points total, but he does present a lot of interesting things for them. When you have that coin zone, your unit gets plus one to defense dice rolls, giving them a four plus, which is pretty decent. And then they get plus one to their morale test rolls, so they go up to a stat five, which is, you know, they, we're improving each of those defensive stats by one, which I think they appreciate. And then getting motivated by coin is nice too, because your opponent will want to probably swipe out the uh, the combat zone from you, and with that, you're left with the coin. At least you can you can kind of counter with the coin and get another attack out there. When you combine this with assault orders, you're able to really get a lot of extra attacks out of this unit, and your opponent really can't do much to stop you from it. Along that same line, I do want to mention a final NCU as Walder Frey. Um, I, the reason why I like Walder for this, when you're looking at this unit, is that you get to have a, a final NCU activation, which is a little harsh because you, you do want to hold Walder Frey towards the end. 
uh, but you are getting an extra attack again. Like you wanna, I, for this unit, in order to get their seven points out, I wanna be throwing as many attacks as possible. So I think that having Braun combined with Walder Frey can make for some really interesting plays. You can get these guys attacking three times a turn, maybe four if you've got assault orders hanging out in your hand. I think it's uh, it makes them quite dangerous and they can start steamrolling through things and really feel like they're a seven or eight point unit. So coming around to commanders, I think one that I don't want to spend a ton of time talking about is Great John Umber. He enables them by having a lot of cards that do extra damage, but do damage to the unit so he can make it. So he, he your opponent, if they don't want to turn the Mormont Bruisers on, he can force you or he forces the, the issue and making them more dangerous just in the onset. But the one that I want to focus on a little bit more and dive a bit deeper into is a commander from Stark Hero Box 3, and that's going to be Mage Mormont, the Lady of Bear Island. So on her attachment card, she has the affiliation House Mormont to make a, a unit a Mormont unit. These guys don't need it, but it's just on her card. She also brings the ability Battle Scars that states, after this unit's attacked, place one order token on Mage. This unit's melee attacks gain the following based on the number of tokens. You can get Sundering for one, or I'm sorry, Vicious for one, Sundering for two, and then at three, you always roll your highest attack die value and can reroll any attack dice. So, uh, Mage Mormont is, her attachment, I have like some problems putting him on this unit because getting that House Mormont affiliation elsewhere on a unit that doesn't normally have it is really where I'd want to have her, but. Uh, I, and definitely having Serio on the unit so you can utilize the Counter-Strike or Brawn. I really like Brawn on the unit too. Like they, they're really hungry for an attachment to make them, or at least the attachments that I prefer to put on them, I think they're hungry for them. But her Battle Scars means that you don't need to spend uh, your, your cards or your Tactics deck cards to, uh, like Northern Ferocity or Winner's Might, uh, to get those abilities on this unit and then when you've got your three order tokens you're always rolling highest dice and always re-rolling attack die value so that's another thing it's kind of like how Sirio eliminates the need to get them down to two ranks uh mage also eliminates the, the need to get them or i'm sorry below two ranks so because you can re-roll attack dice with these guys and have them throwing their full amount of dice and as long as you're keeping them in a safe zone of having two ranks, only one rank missing, uh, Mage is going to be making them pretty nasty. Having Vicious, Sundering, Precision, and Crit Blow, and rerolling all your dice, and rolling your highest attack die value is pretty nice. But again, getting her House Mormont on other units is something that I also appreciate. And some of the reasons why I appreciate getting that is because of the cards that she brings with her. So we can start out with Sustained Assault. Um, this triggers when a friendly unit is performing a melee attack, but before rolling the attack dice, if this unit began the turn engaged with the defender, it rolls its highest attack die value, and if the defender has more remaining ranks than the attacker, the defender becomes vulnerable. So this card can synergize pretty decent with, uh, or decently with the House Mormont Bruisers. Um, you're going to be dug in for combat for a while because these guys are not... They're not wiping a unit in one shot, in my opinion. It might take them a little while to get there. Um, but So they should be engaged with something, or they're nice for the counterattack. You know, counterattack the ability and then counterattack the concept with sustained assault. And typically your defender would have, you would think they'd have more ranks than you in most of the early game at least, because you are going to want to try and at least wipe one rank out from these guys to get some of those abilities turned on or your opponent's going to throw a really high value activation that can try and get more ranks off of them early, but you kind of play into it, into their, their deal by um, attritioning them down to get some more value out of Sustained Assault for getting that vulnerable token out. Support of Bear Island is another card that Mage brings, and this triggers at the start of a friendly turn. You target one friendly combat unit, and they suffer up to three wounds, then restore that many wounds to another friendly unit within long range. If the targeted, or if, if this targeted a House Mormont unit, you also target one enemy unit engaged with them, and they become weakened. So I like this a ton with the the Mormont Bruisers because it works both ways. I can either take wounds from a unit that's not really in the mix anymore, and get some bodies back into the Bruisers when they've taken a few hits, or I can take some models off of the Bruisers and send them elsewhere where they're needed, so that they can get a rank down and turn on some other abilities. So another fun thing is that if you use this card to pull models from the House Mormont unit, 
you would make you would have any units they're engaged with become weakened, and that really helps out with uh, with counterattack. You're able to um, to get that re- get make them re-roll their hits. So if you happen to be um, playing the Serio game or the the Howland Reed game, uh, you're making it quite likely that your opponent's going to be taking some hits for just smacking this unit. The final card that Mage brings is called Here We Stand. This triggers when a friendly unit would be destroyed. You attach this card to that unit until the end of the round, and when this card is removed, you destroy the unit. While attached, each time this unit would be destroyed, it performs one morale test. On a success, it is not destroyed, but remains in play with one remaining wound, and if this is a House Mormont unit, the first time it performs this test, it gains plus two to this roll. Now, I feel like Here We Stand is kind of a fail-safe card when you're looking through the lens of the House Mormont Bruisers. They're going to be pretty dangerous on their final rank, uh, depending on who you have in there. If you've got Mage Mormont and she's stacked up, they're still rolling a ton of dice and having a bunch of abilities on top of it. So uh, get making sure that they stick around if your opponent tries to wipe them out early in a round. Getting Here We Stand makes sure that they stick around for a while, although I don't want to be, like, I don't want to make sure that my commander's unit gets auto-destroyed at the end of the round, especially since, you know, Mage brings a lot of cool abilities, but it is worth, you know, having on them at least, you know, I'd rather have them until the end of the round than not. And we already talked about how many different ways you can get this unit to attack for free, or or, or just get extra attacks, I guess. It's not for free because it can cost cards and NCU activations, but making sure that you can keep them around long enough and get all of those extra attacks out of them if you're trying to cleave through something is quite beneficial. I think that Here We Stand synergizes quite well with the House Mormont Bruisers, regardless of what kind of attachments you decide to put on them. So overall, I really do enjoy the House Mormont Bruisers. I definitely am looking forward to trying to play them in some of my own coming up games. I think that this is a unit that really could have taken advantage of having the rule to reduce attachments that get put on it by one, because seven points, they they feel like they are a seven point unit, but it takes some work to get them to be a seven point unit, and you are kind of balancing this thing about keeping them around, uh, like their efficacy, their, their efficiency turns on when they're kind of in that red zone or the yellow zone of survivability. So this is why I would really like to be, you know, re- re- have a point reduction for attachments because then you're, you, it's it's really weird to flirt with danger on a nine or or eight point unit. But if you have that reduction on attachments, I think that these guys become a lot more of a competitive choice. Um, but because right now I feel like I have to do a lot of work in order to make sure that they stick around or that I get the full use out of them, which isn't the worst thing in the universe, but when you compare to other seven point units that kind of are a little bit more of a contained package, it gets a little bit more, um, it gets a little bit more difficult to, to justify them in a list. But I do think uh, between Great John Umber, who likes to play a little bit more risky, and Mage Mormont, who can kind of keep them around a bit and make sure that they exist in that yellow zone, are good choices for the unit. And I think they feel really welcome in the in the Stark lineup, even though you do have to contort your list a little bit around making sure that they function and survive and do what they need to do. Uh, Let me know what you think about this unit in the comments section below. I am curious to see how other people frame this unit, Um, but I'm I'm very looking forward to trying them out, especially in conjunction with like uh, the the House Mormont She-Bears, just being able to have Warcry to help get these guys plowing through other units. Uh, especially with stacking all the other uh, combat abilities on them is really interesting to me. Uh, I think the, it, like I said, it's it's a little rough um, with the point cost. I think right now my Stark lists seem to be uh, a little bit more on the points heavy side per unit and less so much on the activation side of things. But uh, I'm, I'm looking, I think the next event that I go to in August, I'll probably be bringing Starks and I wouldn't be surprised to see me running uh, a Mormont centered unit or not unit, a Mormont-centered army.